thank you everyone for joining us today to mark International Women's Day. Just to introduce myself, my name is Dr Sabrina Badjwa. I am a clinical academic working within palliative care. I work clinically at King's College Hospital and Guy's in St Thomas's Hospital here in London. My clinical and research interests lie largely within respiratory disease. However, I find myself being pulled more and more into the sphere of inequality uh, research and I would in fact describe myself as a passionate egalitarian. I have two daughters aged nine and six and alongside my husband and the family uh, cats, we all live in West London. So the Cicely Saunders Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Group have chosen to mark this important day by shining the light on women in palliative care. We aim to do this through uh, presentations from two keynote speakers. We wish to showcase the work of two women in particular, Dr Libby Salno and Dr Elizabeth Chung. After their two presentations, uh, we'll have 10 minutes for questions. So to our first speaker, Dr Libby Salno. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr Libby Salno. Libby is a palliative medicine consultant with Central and Northwest London NHS Trust and an honorary senior lecturer at St Christopher's Hospice and the Uni University College London Marie Curie Palliative Care Research Department. Her PhD explored the impacts of compassionate communities and she has published multiple articles and book chapters in this field. She has supported the building of the international movement in new public health approaches, is Vice President of Public Health Palliative Care International, Honorary Consultant at the WHO Collaborating Centre for Palliative Care in Kerala, India, and the President of the Palliative Care Section of the Royal Society of Medicine. She is import also, importantly, a mother to two young children. Libby will be presenting from the key themes from her Lancet Commission on Global Access to Palliative Care and Pain Relief, including the recommendations made for civil society, healthcare systems, researchers, policy makers and government. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, to um, be one of the first speakers in this important event run by Cicely Saunders uh, Institute uh, on International Women's Day. So I'm a palliative care doctor part time uh, in the week and the remainder of my time I'm a clinical academic um, exploring issues relating to death and dying, uh, equity, participation, uh, lay and professional roles. And it's with that uh, hat on I'm talking today about the Lancet Commission on the value of death. So for many, this was a strange title or even topic um, to choose for a commission, but there are a number of reasons why this is such an essential topic for a commission. Death, dying, uh, grief are core universal human concerns. They touch everyone and this has been made more than clear during the past year. How people die has changed significantly over recent generations. Um, we see that specifically in high income settings, but also in low and middle income countries. And some changes have been for the better. People die later in life. Um, much avoidable mortality has been tackled and many have access to pain and symptom relief as they die. But some changes have been for the worse. Um, for many, dying is now prolonged. People are increasingly dying in hospital against their will against their wishes uh, and families and communities are feeling unprepared with managing the complexity of death, dying and grief. And it is this that sets the context for our commission. It was uh, launched in 2018. Um, it has a broad range of uh, different countries, different um, uh, participants, uh, and we wanted to develop this kind of broad base to comment on this, this topic. Uh, Richard Smith, uh, who uh, wrote this article here, launching it back in 2018, and I are the lead authors. And we began um, as a team of commissioners by exploring the medicalization of death. And that was one of the first kind of lenses that we looked through. But we still we uh, realized early on that actually this was too narrow a lens and we needed to expand that um, kind of perspective. It builds on the work from the Lancet Commission um, on Palliative Care and Pain Relief published in 2017. And during the pandemic, we um, this time last year, we really reflected on the role and whether 
this was the right time to publish something like this and whether this was the right um, topic, whether it would be palatable. But we quickly realised that actually uh, the past year has made this more urgent and more relevant than ever. We're currently um, going through revisions post peer review and we are aiming to publish later in 2021. So the approach of the Commission, we took a global perspective. Now it's hard to represent and understand all experiences, but our intentions were to assume a global perspective and to use a systems approach and not stick within one specific um, arena, one specific kind of silo. We wanted to take a broad systems approach. And to understand uh, death and dying, we needed to look beyond palliative care. We needed to look beyond healthcare services. And that's why a systems approach was so crucial. We investigated structural issues such as gender, race and power alongside healthcare services, philosophy, consumerism and economics. So we took a very broad base. And we wanted to kind of start, this is one of the tables from the beginning of the commission, to understand what living and dying is like globally. Um, and there's not one set of experiences. Uh, there's very different pictures depending on where you're living. And so the term we uh, is problematic and we wanted to recognise the importance of language within this. So um, the uh, table illustrates some of the differences that we can see in looking at the first column, um, life expectancy, there's, you know, progressing towards a 20 year life expectancy difference between uh, people living in uh, Malawi and people living in the UK. Um, the Gini index, which is um, a, me a measure of uh, wealth inequality, the degree of wealth inequality in a country, significant looking at the US, um, up there with, you know, similar level to Malawi. And then looking at deaths from communicable diseases, um, prenatal conditions, maternal mortality, um, and comparing that to deaths from non-communicable diseases. So deaths from communicable diseases in high income settings like um, the UK and the US, down at kind of eight or five compared with um, Malawi, which 60% of total deaths in 2016. And again, the kind of converse of that, looking at deaths from communicable, non-communicable diseases up in the high 80s in China, the US and UK, and down in uh, 32 in Malawi. Interestingly, up in the, India and um, uh, Bangladesh uh, having you know, much higher levels. So we can see the shifts that are happening globally, but there is not one picture and there's not one story. And the final column looks at the um, uh, death associated with serious health related suffering, which is, of course, one of the key things that came out um, with from the uh, Lancet Commission on um, Palliative Care and Pain Relief and understanding um, health, serious health related suffering. So there are a series of challenges we have outlined in contemporary dying. Death and dying are increasingly viewed through a healthcare lens. Traditional knowledge, practices and confidence are being progressively lost uh, around death, dying and grieving. And this is increasingly being recognised in um, the kind of social um, scene, the number of books that have been published recently, you know, at all go on being mortal to, to be one. But there's been a huge number of books around how to die well, how are we dying, what are the challenges in dying well. Now, these are often topping bestseller books. There is, there's a, there's a narrative and a need to discuss these issues and a fear that we are losing something valuable. Healthcare services really are ill-equipped to deal with these more complex contextual, relational, spiritual aspects of death, dying and grief. And we know there's tremendous inequality and inequity uh, globally only 14% of the WHO estimates people who uh, need palliative care services are able to access them. And even within countries where there is high um, access to palliative care, there still remain significant inequities. And death has been devalued in our societies. And this is something that's been picked up. Um, for example, Mark Carney in um, the Reef Lectures and other points where understanding that is death something to be defeated at all costs, or is it actually something that is part of our human condition? And of course, it's hard to talk about these things specifically around death and dying without understanding the impacts of COVID-19. And I think it has fueled a further fear of death and not led to the reckoning that many of us anticipated might come, say, when we were considering the impact uh, this time last year. And this presents 
a paradox in contemporary dyeing. And I think this, these two images um, really serve to illustrate this central paradox. We have, on the one hand, millions of people being overtreated um, at the end of life. Many are wishing not to be in intensive care. Advanced care plans may or may not support the um, wishes at the end of life to um, not uh, be admitted to intensive care, to not be resuscitated, to not have life prolonging treatments. But there is a sense of kind of therapeutic relentlessness that it, it is a momentum that is hard to stop. And you need to be very clear with advanced care plans, with um, advanced directives, etc., to prevent this happening. Costs escalate and this can be catastrophic out of pocket expenditure for many um, people around the world, or it can have significant impacts on universal health coverage um, if it's taking place in a, uh, a setting where that's in place. People may or may not have access to symptom control uh, or pain relief at these times. And whilst it's the flip side of tremendous successes within modern medicine around cure and control of many diseases, it is leading to increased suffering. So whilst overtreatment is leading to increased suffering on the one hand, <clears throat> we see increased suffering through undertreatment. And this map, many of you may be familiar with it from the Lancet Commission uh, into pain relief and palliative care. And where we see this is um, the amount of morphine um, used per millig in milligrams per patient uh, for people in need of palliative care. So this isn't per capita, this is in those in need of palliative care. And we see certain countries in the world are bloated, a huge ex um, amount of morphine per uh, person in need of uh, palliative care, whereas entire countries and regions are swallowed up and disappeared where there is really no availability. And whilst uh, availability of pain relief is a proxy for uh, a good death, for pain relief, for palliative care uh, support and approaches. It's certainly a very dramatic indication and that they have named it one of the most stark inequalities to exist globally. So these, so this simultaneous overtreatment and undertreatment is taking place on a global level, but also within each country. Um, where people are dying in intensive care, overtreated, and also dying without any analgesia support or, or um, kind of more holistic support. So we wanted to begin to understand, uh, I mean, these are huge issues. And so our st we structured our commission to um, look at these issues from the um, broadest angle and to capture the kind of complexities, the tensions. We were not looking for conformity. We were not looking to kind of solve or, or um, un answer these uh, issues, but we wanted to capture the tensions that exist. So we have sections on philosophy and religion, understanding death systems, gender, race, disability and power, the role of medicine and healthcare and death, looking at consumerism and choice, fear of death, um, will to live, the wish to hasten death and assisted dying and economic issues. And we've drawn on national data sets, case studies, empirical work, critical reflection and an analysis of the status quo. Why are we where we are and how could this change? And in answering that question of how could this change, we utilised two, two tools um, because we wanted to not just examine what happened, what is happening currently and the issues that we are facing. We wanted to understand how we could change this for the future and to kind of begin looking um, at, at more radical change. So we use these two tools, scenario planning and uh, understanding a realistic utopia. And I'll take us through these two now. So we pose these two questions for these scenarios. The first was to understand, OK, well, we understand how people are dying. or We have some sense of how people are dying of the challenges today. But how may people die in the future? What might happen? And then the further question from this is how would we wish, how would people wish to die in the future? How would we wish to die in the future? So the first question, we utilise scenario planning. Now this is something that um, was used uh, and kind of emerged after the oil shock in 1974, which was almost entirely unforeseen and has been used um, kind of un understanding the future of the NHS, uh, South Africa post-apartheid. Um, so rather than using uh, data to model what people think will happen, they're not predictions of the future, but they're 
um, sketches of plausible futures, understanding what may happen with the limits of plausibility set wide. And it's hard to plan and imagine for the future if we just simply use our existing systems because actually unanticipated things happen, different things happen. And so they're tools for imagining that. So we outlined five different potential scenarios that we may see over the coming years. And we drew on, um, you know, modelling the demographic changes, things like that. But we also um, imagined uh, what may happen. And so we looked at the role of, say, for example, climate change, driving greater equity, um, increasing uh, attempts at immortality, driving further inequity, situations where death may overwhelm health systems, which we did actually see um, at the beginning of the pandemic last year, and for example, in Northern Italy, and roles around rebalancing the difference, um, the care between communities and professional networks, um, or the role of assisted dying. So we use these to help us begin thinking what might happen. And the crucial thing is that not doing anything is an action as well. By not taking any action at the moment, a scenario will come to play. It may be a combination of any of these or something that we have not anticipated at all. And the second tool we used was um, to describe a realistic utopia. Now, this is a tool that John Rawls, um, the philosopher uh, who died in 2002, uh, described and it's a radically different vision of um, society and whilst it's radical crucially it is achievable it's a realistic um, version but one where we set out our best idea an ambitious and bold idea of what the future could be and so we utilize this tool to understand uh, how we could bring some principles together for what dying could be like in the future so these five principles are here. So the social determinants of death, dying, grief are tackled much like the social determinants of health that we understand determine how we live. The social determinants of um, health also determine how we die and how we grieve. Dying must be understood as a relational and spiritual process rather than the idea is simply a physiological event. Communities and health services work in partnership. This cannot be owned. By health services and indeed that's one of the drivers for how we are in the situation we are in now. The conditions that enable people to die well are available to all and that has aspects of services, aspects of uh, support, awareness and understanding and death is recognised as having value and I think this is the most abstract but in some ways the most important uh, part of the realistic utopia. We then looked at current examples of where aspects of this realistic utopia are already happening in practice. And uh, this was taking place across um, across the world. And so we picked four domains where we saw this happening and picked up on examples. So many of you will be aware of the Kerala model of um, community participation in end of life care, where they've uh, really achieved some system level change from policy down to grassroots action. The last aid courses, which aim at focusing building citizen awareness of how you support someone at the end of life. Um, so it's in some ways the kind of democratisation of knowledge of, through palliative care. Uh, the departure lounge, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with in the UK, Project on Death in America, which ran uh, ended in 2003, aimed to change the culture and narratives around death and dying. Um, the books, for example, I've mentioned public discussion and discourse. And then health and social services, looking at ideas of Schwartz Rounds, the SWAN project, which builds end of life care, um, compassion really across hospitals, all hospital staff. Um, and then legislation and policies. So the Palliative Care Commission uh, has got an essential uh, package which it requests and uh, asks governments to ensure is available to all its citizens. Uh, examples of paid bereavement leave that have developed in recent years. So, we wanted to understand, because the, these are examples, these are small scale examples, often in one small region, a small place, uh, part of a country, apart from really the Kerala model, which has achieved systemic change. We wanted to understand how we could develop this. How could we move past these, these good models, but the kind of limited change, small scale examples? How could we achieve, how could we achieve significant change across death systems? And so we're in the process of refining our recommendations, um, but I wanted to give you some examples of um, some of the recommendations that we are formulating. And some of them apply to all of us. And for 
all of us to focus on when we're looking at understanding death, dying and grieving. Relationships are central and they must be both part of the central part of um, how care is delivered, how care is understood. Inequities must be tackled. Death literacy must be built for all and the essential package as outlined in the Lancet Commission to Palliative Care must be embedded by all governments. And then we moved across looking at civil society actions, stories of ordinary dying, rather than looking at the kind of sensationalised models of dying. How do we ensure that people can see the deaths that they and their families have represented across the media rather than the idea of kind of sensationalised dying across media, film stories, um, all these kind of hidden away stories that actually people don't understand and don't get to see. Uh, within health and social care systems, ideas around generalist palliative care, many of which has been picked up in the manifesto um, and described Cicely Saunders manifesto recently released and looking at guidelines, international consensus and support with withholding, withdrawing treatment in intensive care units, for example. Recommendations for researchers and funders to look at how do we change death systems outside healthcare. Healthcare doesn't own death and dying. How can we define what overtreatment is and how, what's the role of digital technology within this? And then with governments and policymakers, we picked out the fact that actually large numbers of um, policies, report strategies, for example, the Marmot report on uh, recent uh, looking at inequalities, no mention of death and dying. You know, these these are significant drivers. The impact of poor um, death and uh, difficult bereavement has huge impacts on people's um, ongoing life, their inequalities, their ability to return to work, etc. So we must end the silence on this, on death policies, report strategies. They must it must be a firm place there. Countries must look to address out of pocket expenditure. Again, a huge driver of inequality for people, you know, essentially using over treatments and med medication is not going to change people's outcomes, but bankrupting communities and families. Looking at insurance models to allow uh, active treatment whilst um, palliative care treatment can continue. You don't have to choose one between two. And for example, things like compassionate leave, carers leave, and bereavement policy. Uh, leave to allow this to be enshrined in policy to allow these pe people to actually um, take the time that they need uh, following following a bereavement. So my final slide, our next steps, we aim to publish the commission late in 2021. We'll be holding a series of um, events both virtual and in person globally to launch the event and we will then be starting, this is the beginning uh, and not the end, a programme of work to understand death systems, to transform and radically overhaul uh, death systems globally and we will be looking for a broad range of partners and collaborators and funders to support this. Many thanks. Thank you Libby, um, I thoroughly enjoyed that and I'm itching to get to the questions. Um, so uh, I'd like to move on now to Elizabeth uh, Chung. So Dr Elizabeth Chung is an Associate Professor of Family and Social Medicine at the uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. She has practiced palliative medicine at Montefiore Medical Center since 2012 and has provided clinical ethics consultations since 2018. Her research focuses on the role of clinician bias in racial disparities in quality of end of life care. She receives funding from the National Centre for Advancing Translation Sciences. She was named an American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine Research Scholar in 2018. It, it, it is my pleasure to invite Elizabeth to present today, where she will be discussing the current evidence base for causal mechanisms of racial and ethnic disparities in end of life care. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, today to speak about uh, what my passion is in my professional uh, sphere, which is uh, racial and ethnic disparities in end of life care. So I'm going to start by uh, talking about what the current evidence base tells us about causal mechanisms of ra racial and ethnic disparities. Um, however, uh, over the past several decades, we've continued to document these disparities. Um, and uh, so we have a ways to go in terms of uh, figuring out how to, um, to, to resolve or narrow these gaps. Um, so I'm going to introduce some critical gaps and limitations on the cur current literature. Uh, which will help identify strategies that researchers, clinicians, and healthcare systems can start to adopt um, in order to narrow these gaps. 
Um, so there's a, a broad uh, evidence base that shows that racial and ethnic minority decedents are more likely to uh, receive uh, technologically intensive care at the end of life, such as CPR, mechanical ventilation, um, ICU and ER care, and are less likely to, to receive comfort oriented care and use hospice services. Um, and this has been shown over a broad range of both cancer and non-cancer terminal illnesses, as well as in the US and in the UK. Um, and so it's important to, to point out that not all differences are disparities. Um, disparities are, are differences that uh, affect the health and well-being of patients. Uh, I negatively affect that. Um, but uh, some differences may be appropriate. And we know in palliative care that our goal is to provide goal concordant care. Um, and so th there's evidence that uh, racial and ethnic minority patients have different preferences on a population basis. So you can see here um, in the top row, um, about twice as many Hispanic and black patients in the United States would prefer to die in the hospital compared to non-Hispanic white patients. Um, and similarly, about twice as many would accept uh, being on mechanical ventilation to extend life for one week. Um, however, I think it's important to think not only about comparing between groups, um, but look more globally. And so when instead of looking at the rows here, we look down the columns, we can see that um, it's also true to say that the majority of people, regardless of their race and ethnicity, prefer the, prefer the more comfort oriented and less technologically intensive care at end of life. Um, so if you were to, to think that uh, when you're seeing a patient, for example, an African-American patient, um, and thinking they're twice as likely to prefer mechanical ventilation at end of life, um, and therefore surmise that the patient in front of you would prefer that type of care, you would be wrong um, at least three quarters of the time. Um, Additionally, it's, it's important to know that, that uh, we're, we haven't figured out how to measure goal concordance very well. It depends on when you measure the patient's goals. So there's not a broad uh, base of literature to support the idea that um, the, the differences that we see in outcomes for uh, racial and ethnic minorities are simply a result of the differences in preferences. Um, in fact, we have some evidence that that's not the case. Uh, bereaved Black family members consistently relate quality of care for the decedent more poorly than white family members, and they report decisional regret reg regarding end-of-life care choices, um, particularly when the care received is technologically intensive. Um, we also know that, uh, that communication with patients about their goals um, does not always result uh, in, in goal concordant care as often for uh, African American patients compared with whites. Um, so there's been a lot of, uh, of good work done in the past couple of decades to try to identify causes. Um, there's been work on different cultural beliefs about death, dying, and the meaning of suffering. Um, there's been work uh, on the distrust of healthcare, which unfortunately sometimes portrays distrust as, as sort of a characteristic of populations rather than more appropriately uh, asking the question of, of, of why our healthcare systems are not trustworthy. Um, for certain populations of patients. Um, the role of spirituality and religiosity has been explored, although this has a very complex relationship with actual preferences for end-of-life care. Um, and education and knowledge about palliative care and hospice services is another factor. Um, and this is appropriately directed efforts towards patients and families, including education and cultural interventions, such as par partnering with churches. Um, but I, I, I put this, brought this uh, uh, literature base in, in the sort of broad bucket of where we take um, one population, which we often consider as sort of the normative population, which is uh, often the white uh, majority population, and we see we get a certain set of op outcomes in this population, and then we take another minority population over here that has different a different set of outcomes, and we say, what is different about this population from our normative population that's driving these disparities? Um, but that actually misses a very large portion of uh, what I think is important. Um, I, another question to ask is what do we as clinicians and what, uh, what do we as a healthcare system do to consistently over time persistently uh, produce these disparities? Um, and I like the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities framework that was published in 2019, which helps us think about this. Um, so you see her in the left column. 
um, the different domains of influence on health, the biological, behavioral, built environment, et cetera. And then um, affecting these domains are the different levels of in influence from the individual, interpersonal, community, and societal. And you can see here that a lot of our palliative care literature uh, focuses here in this individual column uh, about treatment preferences, cultural identity, health behaviors, and somewhat about social networks and peer norms about death and dying. Um, there's been relatively less uh, literature, although some, on the patient-clinician relationship and the availability of health services, which are certainly key drivers. And as you can see, the whole rest of the grid, there's a lot of other areas for us um, to explore that haven't yet been explored very much. Um, for example, at, um, at the biological level and the community of the biological domain and the community level of influence, we might think about how COVID-19 has uh, affected um, uh, outcomes about, around death and dying and disparities. Um, and I, I, I see analogies here to what's uh, being discussed now in the United States about vaccine hesitancy. Um, there's been a lot said about how minority communities uh, may have, be less likely to accept the COVID-19 vaccine. However, one of my colleagues said, please don't talk to me about uh, vaccine hesitancy until we get the vaccine available in our communities. And those of us, like I do, who I work in the Bronx, uh, we see the tremendous uh, structural and technological barriers for our patients to even access the vaccine, uh, which certainly needs to be a high priority to, do, to address. My work focuses on uh, physician, uh, clinician patient uh, communication, and we see that uh, there's, there's evidence that um, this may be a key driver of uh, end of life health disparities. Um, black patients in the United States are more likely to report that they want to speak with a physician but did not uh, around their end of life care. Uh, they report more problems with physician communication and rate their care um, less likely to rate their care as excellent or very good. Um, in addition, uh, the work of uh, Dr. Robert Gramling in New York um, has shown that uh, physicians are less likely to share prognostic, prognostic indications prognostic information with their patients. So here we have patients report that they're not getting the information they want and we can show that physicians are not giving them that information. So that may be a key driver. My work has, has shown some interesting patterns um, and we took, uh, 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 we looked at all 60,000 admissions to two acute care hospitals in our system back in 2013. And we identified about 8,000 of those admissions that were uh, patients who were terminally ill or who had multiple comorbidities or advanced age who might have a palliative care communication need. And we found that among them, um, actually uh, black and Hispanic patients were statistically significantly more likely to have a specialist level palliative care consultation um, compared with non-Hispanic white patients. However, when we did a deep dive into the charts of about 400 of them to try to determine how many had uh, goals of care discussion by their primary team, being the hospital's team or the oncologist team, uh, wh whichever service they were admitted to, we found the opposite pattern. So uh, white non-Hispanic patients were much more likely to receive a goals of care discussion by their primary team. Um, and this is problematic because we know that access to specialty level uh, palliative care is limited. Um, so these conversations really need to be happening with the, the primary team that the patient is seeing uh, most consistently and building that relationship with. Um, so this led me to think about, you know, what's going on here? Um, and my hypothesis was that perhaps our clinicians who in the United States are mostly white and Asian um, may be experiencing these conversations with uh, racial and ethnic minority patients as being uh, more complicated and requiring specialist level uh, uh, um, management. Um, and I thought back to uh, this uh, experience I had uh, in the beginning as a fellow uh, when I was just starting my palliative care fellowship. Um, I had a, a relative, a, a middle-aged uh, woman who was my patient who was dying in the hospital. And we uh, met with her young adult uh, uh, son, uh, children. Um, and when we went to, uh, to the conference room to sit down and talk to them about goals for, for their mother's care, um, I saw the, the patient's son who was sitting across the conference uh, table from me. 
Um, and it was August, the beginning of the year, it was hot. He was wearing a tank top. Um, his arms were covered in tattoos. His uh, cap was pulled down over his eyes, his baseball cap, um, and his arms were folded. Um, and this was a, 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 a Hispanic family. Um, and immediately as I entered the room, I made a snap judgment about um, how I expected the meeting to go. Uh, looking at his body language and his presentation, I assumed that he would be angry. I assumed that this was going to be a difficult and confrontational uh, experience. Um, but luckily we sat down and we did our, our sort of palliative care. Uh, we took out our palliative care uh, toolkit and sat down, uh, introduced ourselves and asked open-ended questions. And when it came time for this, this particular son to speak, he lifted his head and I saw that the reason he had been sitting with his cap covering his eyes uh, was because he was crying. He had tears uh, streaming down his face, his eyes were red. Um, and the things that he actually said were, you know, thank you for taking such good care of my mother. I know you've done everything you can and I know that she's dying and I just want her to be comfortable. So this was completely the opposite of what I expected walking into the room. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit on, on this idea of implicit bias, um, and this is uh, the way that our brains sort of naturally are, are wired to process information in the environment. Um, so when you see this image here and this uh, and this set of letters here, your brain will automatically fill this blank in as an A and read this word as soap. However, if you had seen this image first, your brain would have uh, filled in a U there and read this word as soup. So constantly as we're going th throughout our days, our, our brains are filling in ambiguous uh, stimuli in the environment um, based on our prior expectations. Um, and that's exactly what had happened um, when I, I made a, a split second judgment. Um, so this is sometimes referred to as our type one thinking, which is fast, it's automatic, and it's unconscious. Um, and that's contrasted with type two thinking, which is more analytical, slower, and consciously available to our, our thoughts. Um, and this is what we do in palliative care. We slow the process down and we allow our type two thinking to kick in and to, for us to gather and analyze more information. In addition to implicit bias, I think there's explicit stereotypes as well. Um, and sometimes we see this borne out in how uh, how we how the titles of even our manuscripts in the literature um, depict uh, minority patients. We have why do blacks and Latinos prepare for the inevitable? Why do minorities cost more than whites? And my personal favorite, moving beyond the impasse, discussing death and dying with African American patients, which even from the title there, it sets up already that there's going to be difficulty and conflict, which can affect how people are thinking about conversations when they come into the room. Um, um, so this is an example of how implicit bias works. In this study, um, practicing oncologists were uh, brought into the simulation lab to encounter a standardized patient and daughter, um, and they were randomized to see either this uh, standardized patient and daughter or this standardized patient and daughter. So they were randomized uh, to the uh, race of the, the um, actor, patient, and, and family member. And they were asked to break the bad news of a terminal cancer diagnosis to this family. Um, and you can see here the, the clinicians who, again, in the study were mainly white and, and Asian, as is our uh, physician population here in the United States. And you can see here he's close to this patient. His body language is open. He may be looking at her directly in the eye compared with this picture where he's actually far away. He's got closed body language sort of clutching his uh, chart there to his chest. Um, and they, they, they actually measured the floor tiles here and showed that the, the physician spent more time further away from the patient uh, when the patient was African-American. Um, notably, because they were being, knew they were being recorded and evaluated, the verbal communication was actually the same in the two um, scenarios. Uh, but the nonverbal behavior was not. Um, and this shows that the verbal behavior you're consciously aware of, you're paying attention to, but the nonverbal behavior is probably outside of your conscious awareness. Um, so we, we all know that shared understanding of prognosis, treatment options, and patient and family goals of healthcare is essential for quality end of life care. And verbal and nonverbal communication is a, a, an essential piece of, of providing that shared understanding. We spent a lot of time 
uh, studying the patient, their cultural beliefs, uh, emotions, et cetera, and less time studying the clinician, uh, uh, the clinicians on the side. And this is where implicit and I would say also explicit stereotyping can have an effect. COVID-19 has only exacerbated some of these issues. Uh, we all know that there's disparities in infection rates and outcomes. Um, there's a scarcity mindset. I was practicing um, back in April of last year, um, and there were several days where we had more than 300 patients on mechanical ventilation across three acute care hospitals in our system, and we were down to single digits of available ventilators at that time. So we were almost certain that we were going to run out of ventilators and have to triage, which we did not. Um, but that certainly provided a lot of pressure to these conversations. Um, similarly, during that time, we had a period where we were having more than 20 cardiac arrests at one hospital per 24-hour time period. So um, just our, our, our availability to have these conversations was overwhelmed. Um, the barriers, as we all well know, of using um, technology to connect with patients' families uh, really inhibit that rapport building. And in the United States, we had the compounded trauma of police brutality and, uh, uh, and a lot of focus on that that uh, has affected our community. On the other hand, I will say that uh, my husband and I, we live in New Rochelle, New York, which was the first place to have community spread of COVID-19 back in March of uh, 2020. And we both had COVID-19 early in March. Um, and so uh, being in that experience together with my patients and their family members uh, when I came back to the hospital in April um, really brought me to together with them in a way that was unprecedented in my career. Um, I just wanna to touch briefly before I close on other systems issues. So Dr. Kimberly Johnson has done a lot of work on um, the distribution of medical services and how they affect disparities in hospice use. Um, there's evidence that uh, the, some of the disparities in quality of end of life care have to do with the, um, the quality of hospice agencies um, providing care in uh, minority communities, which just highlights the point that we really need to look at uh, healthcare systems issues as well. Um, and this is a quote from the QI uh, literature, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it, it gets. Um, so we can't forget that focus as well. And this is my last slide. I, I would say there's implications for palliative care teams. I think that we really can be leaders in the House of Medicine on this issue because we have a laser focus on patient, the patient and family as unique individuals. And this helps us, as I said before, move from our type one to our type two thinking, um, which may help us understand these implicit biases better. I often get consulted on patients, uh, minority patients who are described by the primary team as being uh, difficult or angry, and then when I go and see them and spend time with them, we realize that they're going through a normal grieving process. So we can help uh, gently point these uh, observations out to our colleagues and become uh, knowledgeable about and teach about implicit bias. Um, and I'd like to thank my mentors and my uh, colleagues here. And thank you, Elizabeth. I've a fascinating talk uh, again. Um, and now we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so there was there was a question, Libby, during your talk, which um, uh, somebody has asked, under uh, the structure of the commission, can you elaborate on power? Mm. Uh, well, it's quite a lengthy uh, <laughs> part of our commission. And interestingly, in some of the work that we've been doing to um, review after the, we've had comments back from reviewers, we have decided to, to sh totally shift the structure because the power came quite near the end. And actually, we just needed to put that right at the beginning um, to kind of foreground that at the beginning of all discussions that we then go on to have. And as Elizabeth was mentioning, you know, throughout um, the, this past year, there have been huge changes in terms of COVID, in terms of understanding um, health inequalities, Black Lives Matter protests, George Floyd, we, you know, we have to, we had to move all of that right to the beginning because actually rather than being kind of considerations that you come to at the end of a report, they are essential. Then we look at issues around power within gender, um, how different, how women experience palliative care, how the role of caring, and I think it's such a huge part whenever we begin looking at non-professional models of care um, at the end of life, you have to um, 
acknowledge the tremendous thing this this falls to the burden of women this sits on the shoulders of women and actually the inequalities with looking at community models of care you must address that from the beginning so we looked we looked at moving that right to the beginning because um it really underpins all of the work going forward yeah and, and i think i think that's incredibly important and one of my questions was going to be um if, if we're thinking about the challenges in contemporary dying and the significant inequities, um, how, how have women been affected, do you think, during the last year in those terms? Well, I think uh, the policies that have yeah. led to, um, to lockdowns, to um, you know, the huge social upheavals that we've seen um, are significant. Um, so there's issues around obviously homeschooling, um, the ability to work from home, the ability to actually continue your your role, um, the issues in terms of not acknowledging that the majority of um, low paid um, health and social care workers in care homes are predominantly women. But it's also with this is where you know intersectionality comes in because it's not only being female, it's often being from uh, black minority ethnic groups. You have that intersection where actually people are unable to protect themselves, the issue of PPE um, and people on the front line this time last year fell disproportionately towards women and other low paid workers. So there's a kind of range, I think, of how um, we can see um, gender issues have been played out over this past year. And how, how do you think that it, uh, gender has played out in um, how women are affected by uh, contemporary dying. I guess women um, are more likely to be carers in, in, yeah. in that sense as well, aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so j just I think um, Catherine's just put a question in for you, Libby. The, the, the Lancet Commission on the Value of Death must have been a huge undertaking. I'd love to hear your reflection on leading this work with a large, diverse team of others who may well have had differences of opinion on some of the content. Yes. Uh, I think Catherine has hit the nail on the head. Thank you for that question. Um, and I think it's we wanted to have a diverse um, as much as possible. And obviously you can never um, have something that represents all different aspects of dying. And we were really picked up on. We were picked on, picked up on by our use of we um, at the beginning, because actually, who are we talking about? Who are we for the start? And, and can we say that there are representative experiences of death and dying, and grieving and loss? There are not at all. So I've really enjoyed understanding things and being picked up on things and challenged really robustly by the strong group of commissioners. And um, that has been uh, a huge learning. And it's it's it, to be picked up on uh, by people outside of healthcare, outside of medicine, who philosophers, political scientists, who are looking at this um, challenge of contemporary dying with a completely different set of lens lenses. And I've had to leave a great deal of my kind of uh, healthcare, palliative care understanding behind actually we're seeing things in entirely different frames. Um, it's been inordinately stressful. So we were trying to begin to pull this together this time last year. Obviously the pandemic came, I was a frontline worker supporting people at home in their homes dying of COVID when we had no community testing. We had no uh, idea of the disease trajectories of, of the doses of morphine. I was trying to write support the guidelines uh, locally around, you know, doses of midazolam and morphine at the end of life. We were trying to pull all of this together whilst also homeschooling my children. You know, it, it's an enormous um, struggle, but I would say I'm really committed to the idea that things are not right at the moment. And actually COVID has really demonstrated that it has magnified things, which is both a blessing, you know, and a, and a, and a danger, but it gives us an opportunity. And I'm really committed to the idea that we must see death and dying through a social lens and understand the crucial role that health services play, but they are not the only role. You know, they're one piece of that jigsaw. So um, I think it's the stress um, and the enjoyment has only um, consolidated my resolve. <laughs> Thank you, Libby. Um, Elizabeth, um, I, I loved your presentation and I think um, the, the phrase that you use that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it does is, is incredibly insightful. Um, I, I had a question around how do you deliver more type two thinking during a, a, during a pandemic and where you, you've got a pressured clinical environment? Um, sure, I mean, I, I don't think I have a, a 
great solution to that, although I will say that this has really highlighted the, the value of palliative care services. Um, so we realized early on and during the surge in the spring that um, our our clinicians, our frontline clinicians in critical care and emergency medicine and, and our hospitalist physicians really couldn't even initiate these conversations as we usually uh, request that they do before they consult us. Um, so what we did is we rapidly increased our team um, and uh, got volunteers, sometimes physicians who are older or retired, uh, but had palliative care skill sets to provide the palliative care communication set, skill set um, by uh, telemedicine. And that really took the pressure off of the, the frontline uh, physicians and allowed us to be the ones to spend the time and do some of the rapport building things like giving daily updates. So we're not always just calling them to talk about goals of care. Um, and it, and it, was, it was really, you know, although the work was incredibly difficult, I will say that it was also very gratifying. Um, it was it was very gratifying to be able to help out our colleagues in that way and to connect with the patients and families. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I, and I completely agree. Um, and uh, Catherine's uh, a comment saying, wonderful talk, Elizabeth. Um, we know a lot about higher mortality among people with COVID from ethnic minorities. Is there any data about inequalities in terms of palliative care among people with severe COVID? Um, that's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think the data are still emerging and coming out rapidly, um, but that will be an interesting thing to look, look for. And um, Elizabeth, how, how, what is your thought? What are your thoughts on how COVID is going to ha affect health disparities in the US going forward? Um, so I, I think uh, I think we're going to have a tremendous amount of work to do. Um, I think that the 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 racial and ethnic disparities in mortality and infection um, have really highlighted uh, the the weaknesses of our healthcare system, which have been there always, um, but have sh shown a bright light on them. Um, so one big aspect of this is, is really repairing trust uh, with, uh, with with populations that have not been well served by our healthcare system, um, which will really re require uh, a major changes in how we deliver care. So I, I see that as being a, a first step. So lots of work uh, for us going forward. Thank you. So um, on that note, I'd uh, like to draw the discussion to a close. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the speakers and panellists today. So uh, Dr Libby Salno, Dr Elizabeth Chung, Professor Catherine Sleeman and Dr Diokhi Yi. I'd also like to thank Amel Yogani, India Tanard and Mark Willis uh, for all their hard work in bringing uh, this uh, event to fruition. And uh, finally, thank you all for attending and happy International Women's Day.